the God of long suffering. I can't hardly see that word without saying it that way. Long suffering. <clears throat> now God's mercy and grace are wonderful. We talked about last week. Uh, brother Caleb spoke about a little bit this morning, but his long suffering is often far better than we could ever imagine. It's one thing to forgive someone for accidentally stepping on your foot. It happens to me all the time. But it's something different when that individual intentionally stomps your foot every single day. We humans have God's law written on our hearts. We know instinctively that we should avoid certain things and seek out others. But as humans, we have a tendency to do exactly the opposite of what we know is right. That's been a while, but I used to testify of the long suffering of God in my life any time there was a testimony service. If each of us will take an honest look at ourselves, we will see that we have all tried God's patience in one way or another at some point in our lives. And yet each of us has been allowed to continue until this day. When I wake up in the morning, <laughs> here I am, I am blessed. And yet each of us has been allowed to continue this very day. This is God's long suffering. But that doesn't mean we have an open invitation to do as we please. Simply because He's long suffering with our lives, we're still responsible to Him. The children of Israel are a perfect example of this fact, and that's why we have the Old Testament. All things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. For many years, God sent the prophets among them to tell them of their failures and remind them of their promise to obey God's law. When they refused to listen, He began to raise up enemies who would attack and besiege their cities and towns. And finally, when it was clear that they had no intention of listening to his warnings, they were taken into captivity by those enemies. Now, long-suffering doesn't mean weak. When we say that God is long-suffering, that doesn't mean that he is powerless. That doesn't mean that he has, uh, he's just feel sorry for us and he's just going to let us do whatever we want. And it also doesn't mean that God doesn't care. God used the failures of those Israelites to warn us of the outcome of our continual disobedience. We have all likely experienced the chastening hand of the Lord in our own lives. But God's long-suffering nature does keep Him from destroying us at the first sign of failure. We may suffer for our actions, but we also get to live long enough to learn from those behaviors, learn from our mistakes. We may deal with difficult situations, but God intends all things for our benefit. When He sent the prophets, it wasn't to tell them how bad they were, it was to help them understand that they needed to go in the right direction. When He sent the, the, the enemies against them, it wasn't to punish them, it was to show them that they were going in the wrong direction. It was for correction, for their correction, for their benefit. We do need to understand that God's long-suffering does not entitle us to do as we please without consequence. And once again, that's, that's why we have the history of the Word of God. That's why we have our own personal history. We can see that firsthand that this is a fact. The time will come if we don't make the most of His good nature when He will turn us over to our own devices. He will allow us to believe that lie and be damned if we determine to do our own thing. We can't know whether we have a hundred chances left or if we're already sitting on that very last one. No one will benefit by seeing how far or how long they can go before God's long suffering comes to an end. A commentary here this morning. God's mercy and grace, which we studied last week, may be of primary importance, 
but they were far from the only things which God had to say about His character when He was speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai. This week, we'll look at another important aspect of God's nature, His long-suffering. The golden truth, 2 Peter 3, 2, 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, God's long-suffering is clearly seen in our modern world. All we have to do is look around us. Because many may scoff and ask, if Jesus is really coming back, why is He waiting so long? Now, these people, they remain unaware that their own souls are the prime motivation for God's delay. Sadly, each day, <clears throat> excuse me, Sadly, each day individuals are turned over to a reprobate mind for their continuing refusal to accept God's mercy and grace. Yet the human race continues as a direct result of God's long-suffering. This should be God's most obvious characteristic as we behold the cute confusion that people pursue on a daily basis in this country, in this world. The contrary nature of humanity kicks against the kindness of God every chance they get. They recoil from His mercy and condemn those who would seek His will. And He allows them to continue in their chosen varieties of confusion. And He reaches out to them with His love. I can't help but think of, of the years that I spent fighting against God and then about the years I spent attending church, but refusing to fully surrender myself to Him. Through it all, He was seeking my well-being. He was endeavoring to show me His will and the benefits of my submission. As I was studying this lesson lyrics from a song that I used to listen to came to my mind. I think it perfectly captures much of the difficulty that this world endures. I love this song. I I had to go listen to it. And, uh, Surrender don't come natural to me. I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than take what you give that I need. And they're just... Rich Mullins, hold me Jesus. No one has ever found true, lasting satisfaction in the things of this world. Yet we fight God for them. The greatest benefit of the things of this earth are the anticipation, oh, I can't wait till I, I get that new house, that new car, that I can't wait till I graduate, I can't wait till I get this new job, I can't wait for this new raise, I can't wait to go buy the newest cell phone, I can't wait to get whatever it is, I can't wait to get married, I, I can't wait. That anticipation for these things that we want, that we desire. And then we have them, and they quickly lose their... That, that whatever it was that sparked our interest in the first place. They lose their appeal. And we begin to look for something better. And even if we recognize the enemy's attempts to distract us from what's important, we often continue to desire the things that cannot bring us enduring contentment. All the while, God is offering us a gift that will never grow old and never wear out. His long suffering will eventually work our eternal good if, if we will acknowledge and receive the benefit of it. Why is He long suffering? He wants to benefit us. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. He doesn't want us to be cast aside. He wants to lift us up, but He can't unless we allow Him to. I know I've said it before, we, we often think of God as all-powerful, and he, he is. But He's given us the choice. He doesn't force us to serve Him. He gives us the option. He gives us that opportunity. And if we choose to uh, turn away from Him, He'll let us go the way we want. Even, even though He'll still reach out to us. He'll try to help us to understand who He is 
and the benefit that He wants to place on our lives. Lesson commentary, part one, willing to wait. Exodus 34, 5 and 6. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. God's characteristic of long-suffering is a natural companion to the mercy and grace which immediately preceded it in this unusual proclamation to Moses. According to Webster's Dictionary, long-suffering is enduring injury or trouble long and patiently. That's a word we've spoken about before. Does anybody remember the definition of patient? Hey, all right. Now, patiently is an adverb, and it means in a way that shows tolerance of delays, problems, or suffering without complaining, becoming annoyed, upset, or anxious. Now, we have quite a difficult time with this as humans. We may be able to tolerate delays. Sometimes we may be even, might even be capable of enduring suffering. But we often find it very difficult to do so without complaining or getting annoyed. And most of the time, it really doesn't even take that long before we begin to let those, negative, those trials negatively affect, affect us. We tend to forget that Galatians 5.22 tells us that long-suffering is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the works of the flesh, they're plural. But the fruit of the Spirit is singular. Any one of the works of the flesh will defile our souls. But if we're lacking a single aspect of the fruit of the Spirit, we're lacking all of it. What did Paul say? If you, if you fail in one aspect of the law, you, you failed all the law. And so it is with the fruit of the Spirit. If you're lacking, well, I've got all the rest of it, but I don't have long suffering. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is, is not entire until all of those are a part of it. God is long-suffering, and He's called us to be like Him. What is the fruit of the Spirit? It's the Spirit of God. And it's His ability. The Spirit has given us the ability to have the attributes of God, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Is that not what God has been doing ever since Adam and Eve believed the worst about Him and chose to sin? Man and woman reject Him, but God has kept seeking a relationship with His highest earthly creation. Even when man rejected God again and again, God kept seeking. For example, <clears throat> excuse me, He could have wiped out all life because of the sin that had built up by Noah's day, but He did not. He saved a remnant and gave man a fresh start. He also didn't have to give law, the law to the nation of Israel. He could have left them in their sin. But He gave the law and began pointing the way back to Him and holiness and friendship with Him. It's always been God's will for humanity to understand His desire to have a relationship with us. The very fact that human fathers exist is a reminder of who God wants to be to us, His greatest creation. Now, last week at headquarters, Sister Liz Denard said something in a devotion that the enemy has been doing his best to keep me from remembering in my life at all times. Now, growing up, Nick and I, we, we didn't have a whole lot. As a result, I learned not to ask for things that I may have wanted. But Liz reminded me that God is not only a loving father, which is something that I never really had, but he's also able to supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. Yet I still find myself, I'm talking about me right now, I still find myself choosing not to ask God for the things that I need. I'm not talking about stuff, even spiritual things. <laughs> Issues that I may be experiencing with my body. I, I, I don't ask God for help with these things because we as humans tend to equate who God is with who our, who our earthly father is. We tend to see them the same way. 
So how we see our father is how we see God. Why? I never asked my dad for anything. I mean, ever. I might ask him to come and get me, come and visit me. But as far as anything else, I never asked my dad for anything. I don't remember ever asking him for anything. I probably did when I was really little. But I don't remember ever ha having, Dad, can I do this? Can you get me this? Can, I help, can you help me with this? I, I don't. And so when I see God, that's how I see Him. I, I, okay, I just, you, you know what I need. You'll give me what I need. My parents always supplied for my needs. Always had a roof over my head. We may not have had the best clothes. We may not have had the best stuff, but we always had what we needed. And I learned, okay, that's, I'm going to get what I need. And so now I treat God the same way. I'm going to get what I need. God is long-suffering, and He wants to be that good Father that I don't know. I don't know what it means to have a good relationship with a human father. As a result, I have I still struggle. I've <laughs> been in the church for, what, 24 years? 20, almost 25 years? 24 years. 24 years this year. And I still struggle with God supplying for my needs. And He's long-suffering. And He puts up with me. Even in this, God is long-suffering and supplies our needs when we don't even ask. But He wants to build a relationship with anyone who will hear His voice. We're all able, but we're not all willing. He is pointing to the way, He is pointing the way to happiness in this life and eternal bliss in His presence afterwards. That's what his long suffering is all about. He's reaching out to us continually. Uh, whether, whether you're young or old, God's long suffering is the same. Wherever we may find ourselves in this life, God is long suffering with us because he wants what's best for us. Today, God is still long suffering toward a world that has, for the most part, rejected his offer of friendship. In today's Golden Truth, Peter identified that long-suffering as the reason God had delayed the rapture for so long. Peter believed the delay, which at the time when he wrote the Scripture passage was only a matter of years, was evidence of God's unwillingness for any of the men and women whom He had created excuse me, to miss heaven. Excuse me, all we have to do is listen and obey. He'll give us the strength that we need to be His obedient children. We look at it from the outside and we say, oh, I can't do that. He gives us the strength to do whatever it is that He asks of us. Not only the strength, but the desire. God's not sitting up in heaven waiting for us to mess up so He can strike us down and get us out of the way of His plans. He's working good in our lives. He's pointing out the way to peace and freedom in this world. He's crying out to all humanity as His children to avoid the mistakes of their past and turn to Him. He's working salvation to whosoever will simply trust and obey His Word. And He's willing to endure whatever difficulties we may allow to come between us until His will is accomplished in our lives. Now, we may have to face consequences for our behavior, but what good and loving father would allow his children to continue unpunished in their rebellion, knowing what would happen if they didn't comprehend the dangers of their actions? Why do we know what's right and wrong? Because our parents guided us and directed us in those things and helped us to understand. Did our parent the very first time that, that you lied because it happened the very first time that you disobeyed your parents because it happened did they just throw you out on the street and forget about you uh, you might have been punished somewhere or another you may have been corrected chastened but your parents kept you your parent our parents were long suffering with us however good or bad we may have been they were long suffering with us 
because they loved us and they wanted to see the best for us. God's no different. He has that long-suffering nature. That's, that's where parents get that nature from. <laughs> that's why babies cry so much when they're little, to teach you patience, <laughs> because it's only going to get worse as they grow up. <laughs> we need to know that God is the same to us. He wants what's best for us, just as our parents wanted what was best for us. God's concern for us is a clear indication of His long-suffering. If He didn't care what happened to us, we all would have come to destruction long ago. Yet we remain. Part 2, long-suffering in action. John 19, 1 through 3, 17, 18, 33, and 34. Then Pilate took, therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And as we discussed in the previous section, the Bible is full of examples of God's long-suffering put into action. But there is nowhere in the Bible where it is more obvious than the hours that Jesus spent before His persecutors agonizing on the cross. God allowed His own Son to be beaten, scourged, spit upon, mocked, robbed of His clothing, and executed with common criminals, just to name a few of the tortures and indignities that Jesus suffered. God required something of Himself, the sacrifice of a child that He had, not made, that he had made a great point of not requiring of anyone else, not even Abraham. In holding back wrath or rescue while Jesus died, God displayed the unbelievable depth of His long-suffering. With His long-suffering, He paid the price required for us to fully experience His mercy and grace. Now, when we think about Jesus on the cross, we must not forgot, forget that it was our God hanging on the cross in a human body. It wasn't God just looking down on a person. It was God Himself in the flesh hanging on the cross. This was not only the Son of God, this was God in the flesh. Now, we think of, we talk about Jesus being the Son of God, but Jesus was not God's Son in the same way that, that Brother Caleb is Brother Pulliam's son, or in the same way that Camden is Caleb's son. The eternal God took on a human form and suffered in our place. What more could He do to show His people the length He would go to in order to rescue us from our own poor choices? I've said it before, the perfect God of creation could not know temptation. He couldn't know pain. He couldn't know suffering until He became a man. And as a man, He willingly suffered not only the indignity and pain of the cross that the, the lesson speaks of, but as a human, he experienced the pain of full separation from the Father. This world wants nothing to do with God. What is hell? It is full separation from God. And this world wants nothing to do with God. If they have their way, God will give them what they want. And they will regret it for all of eternity. So God remains long-suffering for their sakes. If any will recognize their need for Him and turn from their sins for their own eternal benefit, God is not strengthened by our understanding of who He is. His position as Creator of all things cannot be increased. But humanity receives the benefit when we understand why Jesus came and what God is doing for us on a daily basis to remind us why we are here 
and who He is to us. That is truly long-suffering. Lest we forget it, it was long-suffering that held Jesus to the cross, not nails. It was long-suffering that allowed Him to surrender His human life. As God in the flesh, Jesus did not have to allow Himself to suffer any of these torments. This was the same God-man who raised the dead, walked on water, and could control the weather. Jesus deliberately clung to the cross and died because He was the physical embodiment of God and therefore of His long-suffering nature. Once again, the human and divine nature were separated on the cross. We read in Scripture that the words, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which Jesus cried out on the cross. They're, very, they're translated in Scripture. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But what does the word forsaken mean? And we think about it. We, we think we know what it means, but what does it, it really mean? Forsaken can also be translated as abandoned or left alone. Jesus was fully God and fully man. But here on the cross, those attributes were torn apart just like the veil of the temple. Jesus, the human, experienced the full separation from God that we all deserve as sinners. One perfect, sinless sacrifice for the sins of the world. The pain His human tormentors had inflicted on Him was nothing compared to separation from God the Father. This is the depth of the long-suffering that God has for us. This is how much He loves humanity, that He would be willing to die as a man at the hands of those whom He so loved in order to take their place of torment. Any who would choose to go against Him do so to their own peril. There's no benefit. In conclusion, again, God's choice of character describing words remind us of not only our need for God, but the great lengths He is willing to go in order to pursue our friendship. From the day Adam and Eve rejected Him to the day the whole world rose up against His Son, God has shown His long-suffering with man simply in that He has not destroyed us. The fact that His long-suffering has also allowed us to return to Him, lesson says His friends, but His sons and daughters, makes this aspect of His character all the more amazing. I, I like what Paul said in Romans 5, 6 through 10. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will a righteous man, will, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were his enemies, and he took our place. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if we, when we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We were His enemies. Yet He took our place in death. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44 and 45, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And Jesus, not being one to simply speak, backed up his words with actions when He gave His life for the sins of those who despised Him. How great is the long-suffering of God to this lost world.
how great is God's long suffering on us. We're still here. He's long suffering. Hey, I don't know. I don't know about you. Anybody reach perfection yet? Hands? Anybody? And he's still long suffering with us. He's working with us to bring us to the place that he would have us to be. Go ahead and close there. Turn it over. Pray something was said that was a blessing.